Hello, Working Preachers. This is Matt Skinner. We need you to help keep Working Preachers resources available to the millions of users around the globe. Your participation at any level enables us to continue providing this resource when it's needed most. Every congregation, every faith leader has had to rethink how they can carry out their ministry and share the good news in these challenging times. I'm proud that Working Preacher is a continuing resource for so many preachers in more than 200 countries and territories. I believe that biblical preaching changes lives and Working Preacher is the most direct way to provide support, encouragement, and assistance to biblical preachers. If you or a preacher that you know depend on Working Preacher for sermon writing or for spiritual strength, now is the time to support this resource financially. Our spring campaign is here and we're relying on you to help us reach our goal. We need your help. Every gift counts. When you make any gift to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign during the month of May, you will unlock access to recordings of the Sermon Brainwave team at the upcoming Festival of Homiletics, which is May 17th through 21st, 2021. Additional information about this gift will be included in your own gift receipt. I am so grateful for you, our listeners, our readers, our viewers. It's truly an honor to contribute to your efforts to embody and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the day of Pentecost, which falls on May 23, 2021, are from Acts chapter 2, 1 through 21. I know that's a big surprise for everybody out there. Psalm 104, 24 through 34, and then 35b. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8, 22 through 27. And then selections from the farewell discourse in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, 26 through 27, and then 16, 4b through 15. So happy Pentecost Day to both of you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and to you and to Thank our you. friend Joy Moore, who couldn't be with us today, but. Yes, but uh, yes, happy, happy Spirit Day. And uh, we frequently, often, usually talk about how uh, each of these passages offers a, a unique perspective on the meaning and function of the spirit in our lives. And uh, so I'll just dive right in with John. Uh, and it, just a couple of things I've been thinking about this year. We've got uh, these, these two passages in particular from the Farewell Discourse in John that are offered for year B. Uh, year A is uh, usually, is always chapter 14, 8 through 17, 25 through 27, and then year C takes us to John 20. I think that's it. Or maybe John, maybe year C is the previous one. Anyway. Three sections from John and uh, where we get this, of course, really unique uh, introduction of the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. And the first thing I wanted to say this year is just to remind our preachers of how the different ways that you can translate paraclete as we think about the role of the spirit uh, and the importance of the spirit um, in our lives, particularly over this last year. And we get this idea of the spirit in John as the paraclete, the one who is called to be alongside you, uh, that you can really translate this. You know, it's typically translated in our, in our English translation as advocate. But in these two sections, to realize how many different roles the spirit has as the paraclete. And it's not just the advocate. Yes, that's that's an that's a possible uh, translation. But uh, comforter, helper, teacher, guide, assistant, intercessor, companion, and so that we really pay attention to uh, the roles or the, what the spirit is doing here uh, as embodying what it means to be a paraclete, and to you know going back to chapter fourteen when the paraclete is first introduced that uh, Jesus says, uh, you know, I am, do not let your hearts be troubled. I am sending you another paraclete that he's, that he has perceived his own ministry as, uh, as a paraclete role. And, and so that, that 
The introduction of the spirit here is that in, in a sense, the disciples already know what this feels like uh, to have a paraclete in their lives and that the paraclete, the spirit is going to continue that in Jesus' absence. So that's the, that's the um, first thing that I wanted to mention and bring out in this passage this year. How about y'all? Is that a signal saying you're not done? It you might said. be. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> we've noted that. I think, you know, there's so much attention given in seminaries and books about what the Holy Spirit is. And you're asking us to think more about what the Holy Spirit does, which is, I think, a way better approach to all those different words or verbs or descriptions is, is really helpful. But also, I think what you said at the end is so important that it's all tied in back to Jesus, that this is the idea of another paraclete. Uh, they've already have familiarity with that. But then Jesus' line about it's your, it's your advantage that I go away. This is a benefit of my departure. An important reminder about ascension and the giving of the spirit as all part of the Easter uh, action uh, on God's behalf, which is a John thing. And as we've talked about, it's a Luke Acts thing. It's also a Paul thing that, that we can't just talk about cross and isolation from resurrection. And we can't talk about resurrection and isolation from Jesus glorification. And then this gift, right? The benefit of him now pouring out the spirit for, for all, which makes him now present in this, this new way. But I'd say, oh, I don't, it sounds like too much of a 21st century word in this enhanced way, right? In the bigger, better, more powerful, more dispersed kind of way. Mm -hmm. which is really worth thinking about because so often Pentecost, we get a sense of like, okay, now I've got to introduce you to a totally new way of understanding who God is. <laughs> um, but it's, and that's, I think creates confusion, but it's also not biblical. Right. Well, certainly according to John uh, that, that there's, and it really, I think lends a, you know, reading ahead of uh, or ahead to next week in terms of the Trinity, it lends a kind of uh, recognition that these are not, you know, three different entities, but the way in which there is the expression of all three uh, is similar. And I, I think, you know, the other, I, you indicated that I might have a few other things to say. Uh, the other, the other. It's before, I, before. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, before you go there, let me jump in uh, just because you, uh, you, you each have uh, an entree into two, uh, invited me to my thinking around two things. One is because next weekend is Holy Trinity, you might think about preaching on the, on the spirit twice this week and next week, instead of just mm -hmm. like, Oh, here's my annual. Uh, if uh, here's my one annual thing to say about the Holy spirit, if you're one of those preachers that never talks about the Holy spirit. Um, <laughs> I think in uh, a little book called crazy talk, uh, a, a theological dictionary, I think some friends and I defined said about the Holy spirit. Um, it's like the shy member of the Trinity. That's an old joke, right? But uh, he's like he's like Ringo in the uh, Beatles. Yeah, you either uh, totally don't notice him, or you obsess over him. And I think a lot of, for the Holy Spirit, a lot of Christians are like that. It's either we don't say much ever about it, or that's the only thing we talk about. Um, so, so this might be a chance to talk about the Trini uh, the the Spirit two weeks in a row. And I really do like that idea that both of you already picked up on about talking about all the different things the Spirit does, not just in not, not just in um, Acts and in John, but also uh, in in Psalm 104. And we'll get back to that. But there's you know a whole bunch of different things that the Spirit is doing in Psalm 104. And may, yeah, thanks for that, Rolf. And maybe that invites uh, that invites the preacher to. Uh, ask the question in the sermon, what, how, how do you experience the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit doing in your life? Uh, so it invites that kind of imagination to, from the congregation to, to recognize that, that the verbal nature of the Spirit, what the Spirit is doing rather than having a, you know, the, this, uh, this definition or the right answer of what or who is the Holy Spirit. And I think, you know, the other thing that uh, I've mentioned, I know a uh, uh, hundred million times, but, but that was particularly poignant for me this year is to remember that this, that the Holy Spirit, you know, John's uh, central development of his pneumatology, uh, but this introduction of the Holy Spirit is during the farewell discourse. 
uh, in, in this last night that Jesus spends with his disciples uh, that uh, where he has washed their feet, but Judas has already betrayed him uh, by leaving the room. Peter's denial is foretold. Uh, and you already have in chapter 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be, let them be afraid. It's this, it, it's, it's this extraordinarily pastoral moment Right. And Jesus knows his he's been anointed for his for his uh, <laughs> what's going to happen uh, to him. It's this um, it's this amazing pastoral moment. It's just this moment of troubled hearts and the disciples looking around like who's next? Uh, who else is going to leave? And uh, and then Jesus saying, I am leaving. It's into that moment that Jesus talks about the spirit. And maybe that's another way to think of what the spirit does. It is enters into uh, these these spaces and places of 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 loss and abandonment and and questioning and wondering. Um, if that's an angle that you might want to take of what the spirit does, uh, and I think that that's an important aspect of John's pneumatology is that it's that the spirit gets presented at this point and not uh, previously in the gospel. Okay. I, I think we got John. All right, moving right along. Do you wanna to go to Acts? What's your take on Acts this year, Matt? Same as it always is, which yeah. means I'll just probably say it all, all over again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's I go. don't know about this. Bring it in. That's a good point. I, I think it's a, it's a it's the the uh, the image of regathering is important to me. That and mm -hmm. so again we we have to consider the setting. This is a festival. This is a Jewish festival. Pentecost is a Jewish festival before it's a Christian festival. Still is a Jewish festival. That um, and what we've got here are people gathered. Some who are maybe. Uh, longtime residents of Jerusalem, but who Acts draws attention to are people who are in town for the festival or who are perhaps more itinerant residents. And so Acts begins, or I should say the, the ministry of the gospel under the power of the spirit begins with a vision of a reconstituted Israel. And it's not a reconstitution of the 12 tribes in specific ways, but it's a reconstitution of, of a diaspora Judaism of Jews and proselytes who live in all sorts of far-flung places who are brought together for this moment of, of connection. And it's not that the point of Acts is to somehow you know, reunify or pull what's scattered back to the center, but it's in this moment now where God breaks in and announces good news and in a sense validates or affirms the difference that's there. But it's this reminder that to be a dispersed people is not necessarily to be um, and adrift people or an alienated people. And, and that speaks really important, that speaks differently to me this year because of, of COVID and where we are um, in some phase of moving out of the pandemic, at least in the United States worldwide. I know that's not the same, but you know what I mean? There is a sense of, of regathering and coming back together and telling stories of our isolation, telling stories of, of the last year's dispersion recognizing that church and gatherings and community aren't going to be exactly the same as they used to be, but there will still be a sense of dispersion there. And so it's just an interesting way of thinking about the union, the, the, the uniting power of the spirit in light of real difference and real, um, real stories of loss and trauma, real new ideas about a future uh, that are exciting and scary and, and, but committing first and foremost that we are in this uh, together as God opens up, hopefully, uh, new ways forward for the church to be together and to serve together. Other than All that, right. I got nothing. That just made me think of a crazy idea. What? Well, I liked what Matt said about, well, I liked a lot of things about what Matt said, but especially the thing that about telling stories of isolation and reconnection. Mm. And if so, if you wanted to do, it's like a super cool, um, uh, interfaith connection preach on the book of Ruth 
because as you both know, what is the book that uh, Jews read on the Jewish festival of Pentecost in synagogue? It is the book of Ruth, mm. uh, which, which is a great story of isolation, deprivation, scarcity, reconnection, abundance, new life and community. Mm. Okay, that's what's out there crazy for uh, people that are like that. <laughs> uh, but it's an interesting uh as you kept, kept saying this, all these things, it was like, yep, Book of Ruth, Book of Ruth, Book of Ruth, all of those things uh, connect. That would be nuts. But um, closer uh, closer to home there, um, as noted in the commentary and as noted often uh, by our uh, former colleague, Eric Barreto, um, Eric often talks about how the old view that Pentecost undoes uh, the Tower of Babel story isn't helpful because um, that can view difference as only um, a problem to be overcome. Mm -hmm. uh, the slight danger in Eric's view is it if it uh, because the difference differences are 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 diversity to be embraced. But I think it sometimes does overlook that differences do cause us problems in our communication with one another. And so there are differences that we do have to overcome uh, in order to be uh, the fully diverse body of Christ. And so that's the other thing that really rang with me this year as, as we're thinking about differences so much in, in our society that, that just to recognize that differences are hurdles to be overcome or present challenges that we do have to overcome as we seek to um, faithfully embody uh, the Pentecost church in which the differences remain and, are, and we are all united in Christ. I, I think one, you know, one question I had about this passage or one, one thing that struck me about this passage this year, uh, I think goes back to what you were talking about, Matt, is that, that this reconstitution or this regathering is, is and, you know, uh, is new. Um, there is something, there is a newness here that there's, that because of the events of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension, uh, there is something is happening here that is new. And it maybe that's a way to en enter into the preacher talking about in this regathering, it's not a recapturing of what was before. Uh, that there is no bo no going back to normal, and I just was uh, talking with a group of pastors yesterday, and just how prevalent that is, uh, as preachers, uh, pastors work through this regathering and what that looks like, but this desire for going back to normal, and we hear it all the time, and um, but what if we, but we can't, and so how do we how do we hear in scripture uh, these places where where they are taking stock of what what's happened in Jerusalem and recognizing that that w where is the continuity but where is the difference where is the newness um, where does that take us um, maybe not quite knowing where we're going uh, but that's the promise of the spirit when I was uh, when I was doing the interviews for the festival of homiletics one of the uh, one of the questions uh, with the interviewees was, "How do you define church now? What is what is the definition of future the future church?" And uh, Luke Power, he said, "I don't know." Luke Power said, "I don't know what it is. Here's what I'm holding on to is uh, is the ending of Mark, uh, and where we follow Jesus to Galilee, and that's the that's the trust that we that's part of what the Spirit becomes is this." is that uh, trusting the spirit to see where the spirit is going to take us. Uh, so I think there could be something there too for preachers in, in navigating what things are looking like for them as they regather. And to remind people that Pentecost in the book of Acts is on the one hand, it's, this is a one-time moment where the Holy Spirit first shows up and is the focus of, of the initial part of Peter's sermon. Actually, the, the whole sermon in some ways, but there are other Pentecost-like moments in Acts where mm -hmm. the Spirit launches the church in new directions, where directions whose destination they cannot tell when they begin. And, and, and so in a, in a sense, Pentecost sets the pattern for the church to continue to, uh, to live into. What you got there, Rolf? Got a book called Catching, uh, Acts, Catching Up with the Spirit by Matt Skinner. 
uh, it's been really helpful for me uh, thinking about uh, one of the things that um, I, 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 I've learned from you over the years, Matt, is first of all, the, the Holy Spirit is obviously b present before Pentecost. So in, in Luke 1 and 2, especially, you know, the, the Spirit is prophesying through all these uh, characters, through Elizabeth, through, uh, through Mary, through Zechariah eventually. And so the Spirit is, uh, God has always been Trinity. So what, so my question, and then of course the Spirit, the big moment in Acts, but then continuing, and of course my favorite moment of that is when the Spirit interrupts the Sermon of Peter, which is going on too long. Uh, it was at an X 16. I can't remember six. I don't know. I'm not good with numbers. 10. 10. Anyway, Matt. So what, what is, what is, uh, when, when we come to the day of Pentecost, what is the once and only part of the spirit and what is always been and continues to be? Ooh, good question. I only I ask questions. I don't know the answer to. I would think it's the, it's, it's the image from Joel, which is why Peter goes to Joel. It's the idea of the, the universal filling of the spirit, that the spirit isn't just going to rest on certain individuals, either temporarily or for a certain purpose, but that there's this, the idea of the spirit being poured onto all flesh is the, is the surprise that this, I was about to say that the spirit is now the possession of the entire church, but of course it's the opposite. The church, the entire church is now the possession of, of God's spirit that um, without regard for all the categories we employ to divide people or to figure out who's worthy or who can lead or who, you know, those types of questions. That's I, think that's the, I think that's the newness. Everything else is old. Prophecy, mm -hmm. presence of God, formation of community, equipping for mission. That, we've seen that before, but the, the universal uh, outpouring. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, maybe we should turn to the Psalm for a minute. Um, because I think there's some really helpful things about the psalm and our thinking of the spirit in terms of what are the different things that uh, God and God's spirit do. And uh, the first is uh, the orientation that God delights in creation, which means God delights in you. Uh, I probably say this every year, but there's a terrible mistranslation in uh, one, Psalm 104, verse 26, when it says, there go the ships and Leviathan that you formed, and then it has to be translated to take delight in him or to enjoy him. Uh, there's, a, there's a direct parallel in Job that translates it that way and can only be translated that way. So the first vision here is, look at God has formed all these things. This is a great creation psalm to talk about the Spirit's role, like, like in wisdom or a reference to the spirit you have made all these things the earth is full of your creatures there's the sea and in the sea there's ships and leviathan right the great supposed fearful chaos monster that god formed to delight in him and they're with you know the the familiar jewish argument from greater to smaller and therefore if god delights even in leviathan the chaos monster think how much god delights in you and you whatever quirks you have it's, uh, i think this i don't have um, any you don't have any, mm -mm. No, no, but uh, just just to stop and think about for how many people that's not their orientation towards God, that God mm. is a judgmental, scary, um, and and of course, to the, to the degree that we are sinners, um, we have to take God's um, anger at our sin seriously, but not today, not in this Psalm, mm. uh, and not in this day, that that. God delights in creation, sustains it. Then the next argument is uh, of the psalm is how much God sustains creation, right? Uh, giving food in due season. Um, and then that the spirit renews the face of the earth. And there is, this is one of the three or four places in the Old Testament where you get a hint of the resurrection. You send forth your spirit. They are probably, we could even trans recreated because they've just died and returned to the dust and you renew the face of the earth. So uh, there's, there's some other aspects, corners uh, of the Spirit's work that uh, are worth holding up in Psalm 104. I have one question for you, Rolf. And uh, that is verse 29, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. 
when you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. So is there like a wordplay illusion thing going on with take away their breath, that God's breath is what what was breathed into the dust guy in Genesis 2-7? Uh, Absolutely. The and spirit. they die and return. Yeah, the spirit. Yeah. So I think that's a really powerful there too. Uh, yeah, think- that 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 for people to imagine that you know that uh that very breath of god uh that was breathed into adam in genesis 2 7 the same verb is used in, in uh, ezekiel 37 9 for breathing into the dry bones uh and so uh that that presence of the spirit as without it <laughs> we're we're back to dust uh yeah, and and again, the positive thing is that we have the ruach, the spirit in us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, again, the theological anthropology there. Um, mm-hmm. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, bringing that forward. Absolutely, it's it's mm-hmm. um, built on that. It's 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 yeah. it's throughout there. Yeah. Well, we should close with a word on Psalm, uh, Psalm yeah. on Romans eight. Um, because again, this is me. Uh, here's here's more things the spirit does. Right. The spirit helps us in our weakness. The spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words, uh, and the spirit um, then eventually it goes on uh, towards the end of uh, Romans eight, which is cut off about words about the resurrection. Well, and I think I think the one thing that uh, that I would say here is to call attention to uh, Jennifer Peet's uh, her her commentary, but particularly uh, her line, I, which I think is the challenge of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. How do you set up for people that this is not just a day, that this is a on this is an ongoing life in the spirit, as she says that eight. Chapter 8, 22 through 20, 27 describes the ongoing reality of life in the spirit that uh, we're just we're just getting started in talking about what life in the spirit looks like. If you want to take or if somebody wants to take seriously, I think it was Rolf's recommendation that you do two Holy Spirit sermons this week and the next week, Trinity Sunday. I, I would note a couple of things. One is verses 18 through 21 is part of this paragraph that could very well be included here but then next week the uh the the reading the the epistle reading for trinity sunday is 8 12 through 17 Mm. you could even Mm -hmm. preach 8 12 through 17 this week and then trinity sunday come back to 18 through 27 if you wanted to it could still work but you get a sense with that with that larger context you get a sense of the way in which uh, the spirit also is situated within this this ongoing creative struggle, or this ongoing struggle that creation itself participates in. Uh, you get a sense of of that groaning, of that waiting, of that eager longing that 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 Paul thinks characterizes the Christian life that we sometimes experience, um, other people experience daily, hourly. Uh, but God experiences it too, right? God participates in that same groaning, that same dissatisfaction with the way things are. And, and that could be helpful. You can get into some of the nuances of this passage where Paul says some of his best stuff about the spirit, but also start to work some of those Trinitarian, I was going to say connections. It's really, I would say maybe assertions that also come out um, in, these, uh, in, in this passage. So great stuff, right? The spirit isn't just about, you know, praise and glory and wonder and good work and empowerment. Uh, The spirit is also about knowing that we don't suffer alone. Mm 